George Budge Frederick Byers was born on June 25, 1872, in Charlottetown, Queens, Prince Edward Island, Canada. Byers came up in the bog, a Canadian slum that was crime-ridden, disease-infested, plagued by rampant drug use, alcoholism, and constant, often deadly violence. Some of the hardest fighters in history came from the hardest circumstances. Much like former colored world heavyweight champion George Godfrey before him, it would be the sport of boxing that lifted Byers from his circumstances as he moved to Boston, Massachusetts at the age of 16, putting his chances of survival solely on himself. At 5'8 and a half and weighing around 150 pounds for his career, Byers would not only be a stalwart of the middleweight division, but would even rise to the heavyweight ranks as there was no challenge deemed too risky for Byers. His work on the docks allowed him to develop a physique marveled at by all who came across him. This mentality allowed him to reign as the colored world heavyweight champion and colored world middleweight champion. Much like fighters of his ilk, getting to that point wasn't easy. Byers was a skilled tactician in the ring and could go to distance even under heavy fire due to his peak physical condition and endurance. Byers also competed as a wrestler before boxing, which helped groom him to fight in the trenches in the ring. Byers was also noted for his handsome looks and dapper dress as he was always pristinely groomed and wore the finest fabrics available, a true hallmark for a fighter of color during those days. Additionally, while in Boston, Byers was trained for two years by former colored world heavyweight champion Old Chocolate George Godfrey, a fighter who made a name in the sport at heavyweight and was a threat to the first world heavyweight champion, the Boston strong boy John L. Sullivan. Godfrey would help to mold Byers into a defensive fighter with excellent balance and stamina. The nickname Budge came about due to his opponent's inability to move or knock him off balance in the ring. In order to secure high profile, bigger pay fights with white opponents, Byers, like many black fighters from the time, had to agree to handcuff his skills to allow the fight to go to the middle rounds before unleashing his arsenal. There are also issues of black fighters having their legs attacked near the ropes by some racist fight attendees keen on hurting black fighters. Therefore, Byers, like many of his counterparts, had to master the art of fighting in the middle of the ring and using lateral movement. Boston thrived on the heels of John L. Sullivan, who was instrumental in pushing the sport of boxing mainstream through glove competition. Boston and the New England area in general was one of the premier fight locations during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Thus, George Byers made his professional debut on August 23, 1895 in the fighting town of Boston. Byers would go 3-0-1 in his first four fights, each in Boston. This turned into a New York run where Byers defeated Lon Beckwith on the undercard of the George Dixon vs. Frank Earn world featherweight title match on March 24, 1897. The Byers name would start to gain buzz as he moved into back-to-back -back fights with a fighter named Dan Murphy at the Nutmeg Athletic Club in Hartford, Connecticut. The first contest took place on April 5, 1897. Byers proved to be the stronger and more scientific of the two and dropped Murphy in the fifth round of the 10-round contest. Murphy would recover and hold up for the remainder of the fight, having his best round in the 10th and final round. Referee Jerry Reagan was the sole judge in the contest and declared the fight a draw in the end. The two would be back in the ring on May 25th in the same location. They would this time fight to a 15 round draw. On September 23rd, Byers would step in with the long and lean Charles Goff at the Gladiator Athletic Club in Hartford, fighting to a 12 round draw with his 5'10 challenger. Byers and Dan Murphy would meet for the third and final time on November 11th in Waterbury, Connecticut. In front of 2,000 plus fans, it was reported to be the hottest contest the city had ever seen. Byers and Murphy delivered an action finale. Byers floored Murphy in the ninth round, though he was able to recover. Murphy rallied and floored Byers in the tenth round. Byers again returned the favor by dropping Murphy for a second time in the eleventh round. Murphy got up, though he was on groggy legs. 
Murphy was able to recover and continue to battle back with Byers, both mixing it up throughout the remainder of the 20 round contest. In the end, the fight was declared a draw, though those in attendance felt that George Byers was a true winner of the contest. In what was then his biggest matchup to date, on December 9th, 1897, Byers would take on 6-1 Harry Peppers in a fight billed as the colored middleweight championship of the Pacific Coast. This would be Byers' coming out party as in the 19th of a 20 round contest, Byers knocked out Peppers to become the new colored middleweight champion of the Pacific Coast. Some reported this as also being the colored world middleweight champion title outright. Byers would face his stiffest test on September 14th, 1898 in a fight billed as the colored world heavyweight title fight against multi-time colored world heavyweight champion, the crafty Texan Frank Childs. Childs had become the colored world heavyweight champion after defeating Bob Armstrong a year earlier. The fight took place in New York. The contest was fought at 165 pounds. In a back and forth fight where both fighters took damage, George Byers would have his hand raised as the winner after 20 rounds. With the win, Byers became the new colored world heavyweight champion. Byers' next fight would be a fast and furious 20 round draw with heavyweight contender Jack Bonner on December 13th to close out 1898. Byers would open up 1899 in dominant fashion as he rematched Charles Goff on April 3rd. Byers sent Goff to the canvas three times before picking up a second round TKO victory. Two fights later on May 30th, Byers fought a three rounder with the well traveled Dick O'Brien in Pawtucket, which was ultimately ruled a no contest. Byers fought Billy Stiff to a six round draw on June 16th in Chicago. In a fight some reports billed as a colored world heavyweight title defense for Byers, on July 24th, he would step in the ring with Charlie Strong for a 20-round contest in Brooklyn. Strong was a late replacement for the injured Frank Childs, who Byers had previously defeated to win the title. Strong came out of the gates on fire as he attacked Byers with wild swings. A left to the jaw sent Byers to the canvas in the first round. Surprised, Byers hopped up immediately and finished the round in good standing. Byers used his defense and agility to avoid Strong's rushes in the second as he peppered him with shots. Strong still forcefully rushed through the next couple of rounds, with both men hitting the deck in a clinch and a cut opening up near Byers' left eye. Byers started to work Strong's body through the fifth as Strong continually aimed for Byers' damaged left eye. From there, Byers stuck with the blueprint and started to tee off on the gas Strong in the ninth round, sending him to the canvas. Strong could stand but was helpless from that point forward as Byers backed him to the ropes and pounded him. This forced the referee to step in at 2 minutes and 50 seconds to call the fight, handing Byers the ninth round TKO victory. On September 4th, Byers would step in the ring with the UK-born light heavyweight Tommy West for a catchweight fight in Brooklyn. Up to this point, Byers had escaped defeat in his first 20 contests. In the seventh of a scheduled 25 rounds, West landed a jolting right hand to the jaw of Byers that sent him down and out for the count, handing him his first career loss. Byers would draw with Dick O'Brien on December 28th to close out 1899 before stepping in the ring on February 22nd, 1900 to take on George Gardner, the former world light heavyweight champion and world middleweight title claimant from Ireland. The bout was scheduled for 15 rounds and prearranged as a draw if it went the distance. Gardner was known to be a skilled, clever boxer. On this night, George Byers would lead the way for the entirety of the contest and had the better go of the contest, though he couldn't get Gardner out, thus resulting in a draw. The two would be back in the ring on February 22nd. In the 14th of another scheduled 15 rounds, Byers would be disqualified after hitting Gardner while down. This was the only disqualification loss of Byers' career. On March 16th in Chicago, Byers would fight to a six round draw in his rematch with Frank Childs, retaining the colored world heavyweight title. Byers' third and final meeting with George Gardner would occur on May 14th. The two fought a lackluster fight and reported to be bluffing over the 15 rounds. The bout was ultimately ruled a no contest. 
This led to a May 30th draw with Dick O'Brien over 15 rounds. On January 18th, 1901, Byers faced the first world light heavyweight champion and former world heavyweight title challenger, Jack Root. Root took the lead from the jump as he pressed Byers. Root dropped Byers twice in the fifth round, though Byers was able to get up and battle back each time. In the seventh, Byers was dropped five times, staying on a knee up to the nine counts each time. Byers was sent down and out via knockout by Root in the ninth round of the contest. Throughout the affair, a portion of the crowd cried fake each time Byers went down under the assumption it was on purpose. Byers' next contest would be a March 16th long-awaited trilogy with the crafty Texan Frank Childs in Hot Springs, Arkansas, with the colored world heavyweight title on the line. Childs had a 10-pound weight advantage in the contest and essentially gave Byers everything he could handle and more. In a manner of bravado, Childs stood still in the fourth round and let Byers tee off with three straight clean shots to the face in an effort to show he couldn't hurt him. Despite his efforts, Byers didn't have the power to bother Childs on this occasion. After dropping Byers three times in the seventh, Childs would go on to knock out Byers in the 17th round to regain the world colored heavyweight title. On August 19th, Byers would take on the enigmatic former world welterweight champion, mysterious Billy Smith in a middleweight contest in Canada. The two men would fight to a draw over 15 rounds. This led to a November 9th points loss in a rematch with Billy Stift over six rounds. After an October 30th draw with Dick O'Brien, Byers would take on the well-traveled Jack Twin Sullivan. Byers put on the defensive clinic over six rounds in a fight the referee ultimately declared a draw. Size would prove to be no issue for Byers when he opened up his 1903 campaign with a January 22nd matchup with Big Sandy Ferguson a six three and a half heavyweight contender from the era. The two men fought to an eight round draw before rematching on April 8th with Ferguson winning a 12 round points decision. This led to a May 23rd matchup with former world light heavyweight champion, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien in Philadelphia. Byers dropped O'Brien to the canvas in round one but failed to capitalize and after six rounds, the decision was given to O'Brien. In the final two notable fights of his career, Byers would knock out former American, British, and Australian middleweight title challenger Dick Moore in three rounds on July 31st, 1903. This led to a March 14th, 1904 eight-round TKO victory over Portland's hard-punching, thin-chinned Black Fix Simmons. Byers would fight two additional times in 1904, gaining wins before calling it a career for good. It's reported that Byers' most outstanding accomplishment was a May 1899 private affair in George Godfrey's Massachusetts gym, where he thoroughly outclassed former world welterweight champion and one of the greatest pound for pound fighters of all time, Barbados Joe Walcott. Byers is reported to have left Walcott a bloodied, bruised, and beaten fighter, which few in history could achieve. Byers also spent time as a trainer in his retirement. His greatest pupil, none other than a man regarded as the greatest fighter of all time, the Boston bone crusher Sam Langford. In recollection, Byers ended his boxing career while he was in his prime at 31 years of age. The world middleweight champion then was Tommy Ryan, undoubtedly one of the greatest fighters of all time, who drew the color line. Therefore, Byers saw no need to continue fighting without the opportunity for a shot at his primary division's top crown. This, though, didn't stop him from stamping his name in the annals of history as one of the greatest middleweights and boxers in general that the sport has ever seen. May his legacy live on. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe.